Good morning, church family, and it's a pleasure to, for me to be here to preside over our worship service today. While many of our countrymen are still suffering through the uh, how the typhoon Ulysses uh, really just ravaged through our country, we are reminded today that we can still worship and give praises to our God and give Him all our thanks and really just ascribe to Him all glory and praise. But while many of our countrymen are obviously suffering, we want to just put things into perspective that God is in control. And this is why we continue to worship in spite of everything. As we begin now our time formally, we would like to read together Psalm 93. And as it is flashed on your screens, for those of you who are home or listening through radio or even here in the auditorium, let us all read together Psalm 93. And it says, The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Shall we pray as we begin our time to worship? Lord, we just want to remember the many, many of our kababayans and our countrymen who are suffering until now because of Typhoon Ulysses. And so as we now put things into perspective, as we worship you and praise you through song and even through prayer and even later on through the study of your word, would you help us now to internalize how you are still in control of everything in spite of the many, many depressing things that we're seeing in the news. And even many of us, friends and loved ones, suffering through the typhoon even until now. We put things in perspective, God. You are still in control. And we long to see for our church to really rise up and say that, God, we still worship you through it all, through it all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Good morning, beloved. Before I say anything else, I would just like to thank you those who are here. Of course, we acknowledge our online audience, our radio audience, but I want to give a special welcome to those who are on site. You know why you move my heart so much? You just turned ODB into a church again. This used to be just an auditorium. I still remember preaching to an empty auditorium with just the cameraman and the sound man up there. Thank you, every single one of you, for showing up today. Thank you for having the courage to show up. This morning, I would like the joy of leading you all, both our online radio and on-site audience, in prayer for our country. You probably know what has been happening. Uh, I don't think you just awoke from a coma. You all look very healthy. You know, we've been just been battered by some of the worst storms in our history, one after the other. So we'll be praying for our poor country. And many of those afflicted are our own flock. There are people in our own flock who who've asked help from us, and we are going to pray for them too. We cannot mention them by name, but uh, they know who they are. They've asked for help also from the church. So let's join our hearts this morning in the community prayer. Father, our hearts are still so filled with joy at saying, you are the God over all these things. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. That's probably how a lot of us are feeling right now, weak. Because, Lord, after the battering of the virus for the past eight months now, here comes three storms, one after the other. Raleigh, Shuning, Ulysses, and if not even recovered from one crisis, and here's another. And this crisis, Lord, has affected our very own flock. 
So, Lord, we pray for our poor country, the Philippines. Lord, have mercy on those stricken by the three typhoons, but especially the last one. You know who the people are, Lord, in the eastern regions of the country, in Catanduanes, in Bicol areas, in Quezon, but especially in Cagayan, Lord, where it is now like a lake. Have mercy on them, Lord. And Father, you know our own church is in its small way trying to help. We're raising funds. First of all, because we have also our own small relief operations spearheaded by the crisis response team. And the Council of Deacons, we have our own small efforts, but we're also partnering, Lord, with other bigger organizations that have feet on the ground. So, Lord, bless the efforts of the government, the, the national leadership, Father, the local government leaders. We know sometimes the efforts of the local and national governments are hindered by politicking, people who want to be remembered for the next elections. Lord, we plead with you that you please remove such desires in the hearts of the people overseeing this. Let them just really help those who are stricken this time. And we pray that you bless their efforts, Lord. Please make them succeed in helping our countrymen, those who are still on the rooftops, those who are in evacuation centers, those who are still wading through the flood, those who went back to their homes to find it looted or everything they own destroyed or filled with water and mud. People in Marikina, Cainta, Pasig, Lord, other areas of Metro Manila. Lord, you know who they are. Some of them are from our own church, Lord. Some are from our satellites, and they're all hurting right now. So bless the efforts of our government. Bless the efforts of the private sector. Bless the efforts of uh, little organizations like ours, Lord, that are trying to help in our own small way. We pray, Lord, for those who are in this flock, Lord, who had to be evacuated. They had to be exposed to people, Father, outside the safety of their homes, and you know that the virus is still raging. So, Lord, we pray that you protect our people and the rest of our country, not just from the flood, but even from the virus, because those who were evacuated were exposed to this and have a much higher risk now getting infected. So, Lord, it's like a double whammy for them. Have mercy, Father, on these people. And, Lord, as we pray and as we look at Psalm 126 today, help us realize it is addressing our mourning, not just as a church, not just as a flock, but even as a country. It's a national lament from which, Lord, we can get comfort, not just as a nation, not just as a church, but even, Lord, as individuals, that those who sow in tears shall reap with joy. And whether that's GCF, sowing in tears, mourning because people are still too afraid to worship on site, or for other reasons like a typhoon that devastates the country, or a virus that has destroyed the economy and the lives and relationships of people, Help us look to you, Lord, and continue to sow in faith, even if our faith merits nothing but tears in the present, Lord. Help us to continue in faith and sow in faith, even if there's nothing but tears that we get for now. Because we know that you are faithful, Father, and we know that we shall weep with joy. We thank you, Lord, because your faithfulness is our only bulwark, our only source of hope, our only buttress, the only wall we can lean on during this time. You have been faithful in the past. You are faithful now, and we know you will show how faithful you are again. Even as we allow ourselves to lament and mourn, we know you are faithful and will still be faithful. So we end by rejoicing, we end by thanking you, we end by worshiping you, our faithful God in the midst of our lament. We thank you, Lord, for who you are, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May I invite you now so that uh, we can read Scripture together. Our passage is found in Psalm 126, verses 1, 2, 6, just six verses. Let's read. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. 
Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. When the Lord has done great things for us, we are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. May God be blessed with the reading of his word. You may all take your seats. Again, a pleasant good morning, beloved. And if you're joining us, perhaps for the first time, just in case you're online or probably here and you're joining us for the first time, our series is called The Psalms, Songs to Keep Your Life in Tune. Why do we say they keep your life in tune? You see, if you will sing the Psalms personally, you don't have to put the uh, music to it. But if you will take the lyrics seriously, they will help you live your life right before God. And as we live our lives right before God, we will find joy in this life. You see, if there's one thing I'd like to drive home every time I stand before you, it's this. Our God doesn't want us to just enjoy heaven. He wants us to enjoy life here too. Because here, He's teaching us how to walk with Him in faith because we cannot see God. We cannot touch Him, feel Him, or, or even uh, palpably feel Him. But God wants us to enjoy this life and these songs keep our lives in tune. And we happen this morning to be in Psalm 126. I know the title seems unusual, but it's part of what we just, we just read, right? Those who sow in tears shall reap with joy. I hope you keep that in mind because that's the bottom line of the entire psalm. That's what it's really saying to all of us. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joy. And you know, I'm fond of saying this. God really has a great sense of timing, doesn't he? You see, when I uh, submitted this outline last Wednesday, there was no Ulysses yet. And I was thinking to myself, paano kaya maging relevant ito? How can I make this psalm relevant to an entire nation? I mean, I, I want it to be relevant to you, worshipers here, worshipers online. And then what happened? Ulysses came. And then I realized, again, this is God's perfect sense of timing. We are a nation in mourning today. As if the devastation of COVID was not enough, two weeks ago we were, you know, threatened by what? Super Typhoon Raleigh, right? And everybody said, including the U.S. weather forecasters who are really good at what they do, it's Category 5. It might make Yolanda look like a small storm. Praise God. We prayed very hard. I know the entire nation was praying very hard. And it somehow did not do as much damage as it should. But remember what happened right after Raleigh, no? Right on the heels of Raleigh was Shonin. Now somebody joked, maybe Shonin watched too many Korean love dramas. You know, the fad today. Because it did not want to be separated from Raleigh. Uh, Shuning didn't do much damage, right? But psychologically, it was very, very discouraging for a lot of us. The entire nation. Here comes Rolly, and then right after that, Shuning. But as if that wasn't enough, here comes Ulysses, like, uh, you know, angry, like a spurned lover. It comes, and it, we didn't see it coming. Nobody saw how much damage it would do. It would actually hurt Metro Manila much worse than Rolly did. And so, friends, that's the situation we are in. And Ulysses hasn't just hurt the nation, it has hurt many of us here in this church. As we're talking, there are people that we're helping right now. Our lay leadership are partnering with other people, and also we have our own small relief efforts to help them. And so we are in mourning. We are in lament, not just as a nation, but as a church. And maybe there are some of you who are saying, I've been mourning long before Ulysses, Pastor. Maybe even before COVID, Pastor. Because I've been mourning in my own life. Then this psalm is especially for you, my dear sister or my dear brother. 
Psalm 126 is a community lament. I know when we were reading it, it didn't sound like it because it starts very positively, no? It was like a song of rejoicing. It doesn't look like it because verse 1 begins like that. But then when we were reading, if you remember, in verse 4, suddenly it gets at the lament. Uh, in verse 1, it was recalling a time of God's mercy. Then in verse 4, it says, Lord, do it again, please. A fresh show of your mercy. And friends, I hope it helps us understand that you realize that the psalmist who wrote it, and then the people who sang it, and then us today who study it, and our mourning really need to hear this because this is what God knows we need. The psalmist who wrote it probably had this need in his heart to mourn. The people who sang it after he composed it needed it. And now we do, you and I. Similarly, God's people may take encouragement, that's you and me, from past events of mercy and pray for more. We're not being ungrateful when we ask for more mercy because that's what you'll see in the passage, by the way. The memories of those singing laughter-filled days becomes not nostalgia. You see, that's what we often think. Uh, the good old days, the good old days, well, like the Rico Puno song. That's a wrong attitude. When you are a believer, you never say the good old days, the good old days. You always say, the past may not have been good, but the present is better. And the future can get only better because the best life is coming. It's not now. It's coming. And that's the best life that could ever be. Friends, that's what we're trying to learn here. Those singing, laughter-filled days of the past are not nostalgia. They are the ground of a strong hope and unsinkable faith that there will be even better days to come. If God has been good in the past, He will continue to be good today, and He'll be good to us in the future. That's what Psalm 126 wants us to learn. So, beloved, here's what I'd like you to remember. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joy. The best outcomes often come after the hardest struggles. Let's look at how this can become so true for us as it was for them. In verses 1 to 3, this is what we see. We are reminded to praise God for all your past blessings. This is a poem. When I was in high school, I was an aspiring poet. And I like the poetry of verses 1 to 3. So I will read it for you because I just love how it flows, even in English. Can you imagine how beautiful this must have been in Hebrew? It says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. How poetic, isn't it? What is described here, friends, is one of the greatest revivals in the Bible. You see, the psalmist who wrote this, we don't know exactly who, was talking about the return of Israel from Babylonian captivity. Do you remember who conquered the last portion of Israel, the nation, tiny nation of Judah? It was Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, who were the world power at that time. Because the Israelites had become idolaters, they had turned away from God. God used other nations to judge them, to discipline them, so that they would return to the Lord. Seventy years of captivity in Babylon. And then God allows Babylon to be overwhelmed, and eventually the ruler who takes over 70 years after Israel has been taken into captivity, Cyrus says, okay, Israelites, you may go back to your country. And so that's what this is referring to, verses 1 to 2. When the Lord restored the fortune, the captives, it's saying it was like a dream. I could not believe it. We were singing, we were laughing, and we were shouting joy. This is one of the greatest revivals in the Bible. In fact, if you'll open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 8, you'll see that's the culmination of it. After three successive waves of returns, and by the way, not everybody returned. I'll tell you why in a moment. 
after three waves of returns. In Nehemiah chapter 8, that's where this probably culminates. There is the revival at the Watergate. This is not the Watergate of Nixon, okay? That's where they probably got the name, but this was the original Watergate. And this is a revival, not a scandal, unlike what happened in Washington. The Watergate is where the people in Nehemiah 8.1 begged Ezra, the priest, bring out the book. That's God's law, God's word. They said to Nehemiah, bring it out. Why? They were hungry for God. They were looking for God. That's a revival. This is a spiritual revival that was sparked by a national patriotic revival, a return, literal return of captives from, from Babylon. And so that's what they're saying here. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has, grand, has done great things for them. And he acknowledges it. He said, the Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. What happens? Even hostile nations recognize the gracious hand of God behind it. Why did hostile nations even give glory to God? Because they celebrated. They worshiped. That's what you found in verse 1, remember? We were filled with laughter. We were, our tongue with shouts of joy. They were worshiping God. And that's found in Nehemiah chapter 8. In fact, their celebration in Nehemiah 8 evoked the jealousy of their enemies. The other nations were jealous of them. But initially, they were saying, the Lord has done great things for them. Why? Because they worship God. And Nehemiah chapter 8 tells us about that. Here's the application for you and I. Christian, do you celebrate God's goodness to you personally? Do you? We better. You know, sometimes other people are better at seeing God's blessings to us than we are. Did you realize that? People look at us and say, wow, how blessed you are naman. And we say, ano ka? Ano yun? And then we realize how dense we are. God has been blessing us. People see it. People perhaps are not even Christians. And then we say, where? Saan? Ano? And that's what's happening here. At least here, it's positively stated, the other nations saw them worshiping and celebrating the goodness of God. That's why we need to celebrate God's goodness. We need to be grateful people, my dear friends. Here's the question. Please think about this question. I want us to ask ourselves this question. Why will God bless Christians with more blessings who aren't even grateful for the blessing they already have? May I repeat that? Why will God bless Christians with more blessings who aren't even grateful for the blessing they already have? Put yourself in the place of God. He blessed us. He blessed you. And what do we do? We're looking the other way. Okay, we're saying, uh, wala na. No more? Is that all? And so, put yourself in God's place. It's probably saying, I just blessed you. Can't you even say thank you first? And now you're praying for more blessings. What we learn here from the grateful Israelites, friends, who worshiped God in Nehemiah 8 is, their worship, their celebration was a good testimony, even to hostile people. Let's not ask God for more until we have worshiped and thanked Him for what's already in front of us. Did you get that, friends? Let's not ask God for more blessings until we have taken an inventory of what's already there. And then say, Lord, thank you for this, and then this, and then this. Thank you. And then when God perhaps sees our hearts develop right, then he'll say, you're ready for more blessings. Because you already know how to be grateful. You know how to worship. But until we learn, God will say, I don't think you can handle more blessing. You cannot even handle small blessings with gratitude and worship. What will happen to you if I bless you more? You'll probably turn away from me completely. Friends, grateful believers don't necessarily have the best circumstances. Please don't ask me to prove this to you. Because I don't want to give away secrets of my counselees. I want you to know some of the happiest GCFers I know don't have the best economic situation. So please don't ever tie happiness with economic data. It does not hold true. Believe me. I'll not say more because 
I might be betraying confidences if I say more. Grateful believers don't necessarily have the best circumstances, but they are thriving. Why? They see the hand of God in everything. And they see it as a loving hand, not a punitive hand, not a heavy hand. It's a protecting, guiding, caring, fatherly hand. And so whatever they're going through, they always in their heart say, God is behind this. God has permitted this. And so I'm going to find peace. I'm being battered right now. I'm suffering right now. I'm hurting. But I know God is behind this. And I trust him. So I'm not going to sink in this. I'm going to thrive. And they do. Believe me, I've seen it happen so many times. To not tell you this, grateful believers don't have the best circumstances, but see the hand of God and everything. And that kind of attitude of gratitude is what enables people to worship God for what's already given to them. And be able to thank God even for the trials and training, the discipline too. They're meant for your good and not your harm. So friends, before we leave the first point, let me just summarize it this way. Paint your personal picture of God based on His goodness to you in the past. That's my request to all of us, myself included. Paint your personal picture of God based on His goodness to you in the past. God has been good to you. We are still alive. We're not in the ICU. We're not in jail. God has still been good to us, friends. Remember the good, forget the evil, and move on. Paint your personal picture of God based on His goodness to you in the past because that's what we learn in verses 1 to 3. Like the Israelites, let's praise God for all our past blessings. But now the lament is brought out in verse 4. Look at it. I'll read it for us. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the desert. In Hebrew, the word fortunes there is the same word in verse 1. So it refers primarily to their fellow Israelites. But because it's a generic term, it's not limited to the captives. So they're actually saying, Lord, We have been rejoicing. We have been partying. We've been celebrating. We were worshiping. But Lord, there's a a part of us that cannot completely rejoice because we have still relatives and friends back there. And you know why they still had relatives and friends back there? It wasn't necessarily against their will. Maybe that added to their sorrow. Some stayed behind in foreign lands for fear. You know, uncertainty. I don't want to go back to Israel. Why? Why don't you want to go back to our native land? It's devastated. Uh, It's been ravaged. It's been left empty for 70 years. Do you seriously seriously think we can live there after 70 years of, of devastation? No way. Uncertainty, fear. The others were saying, you know what? It's more convenient here. I'm already married here. I have a business here. Convenience. So whether it's fear or convenience, there are people who stayed behind in the land where they used to be captives, even though they were free. And this was breaking their hearts, friends. Because the Israelites were saying this, and were saying, we want to worship together. We want to be whole again, an entire nation whole again. We want to see friends, loved ones, not staying behind there for convenience, not staying behind there because of fear. We want them to come here because of faith. That was their situation, friends. What they remember about the past, they now pray for in the present. They plead with God for the complete return of all exiles. Like the long for return of rain in the desert causing it to bloom. I know there's a strange word there called the Negev. I I remember not knowing what Negev means until because of our dear GCFers, now with the Lord, Nina Tanshi. For the past eight years until the lockdown, I've been leading a group, various people of you, through the Holy Land. And our Israeli tour guide would always say, we are passing through the Negev. What is the Negev? That's the southern portion of Israel where it's mostly desert land. And he'll point out the wadi. You know what a wadi is? It's a stream bed. Stream bed. During winter, 
the snow accumulates in the mountains. And then during early spring, the snow melts. And those dry desert stream beds would suddenly become raging rivers. In fact, some people have died who were careless enough to be, you know, looking for things in the stream beds. And then a flash flood would come. That's what he's referring to here. Restore, Lord, our fortunes. Restore our blessings, our fellow captives. Restore our nation like the springs in the Negev, like the streams. When they flow, what happens? The desert blooms. That's where you will see flowers springing in a dry area. When there are streams in the Negev, and that's what they're saying. We're lamenting because our our, our fellow Israelites are staying behind. How can we rebuild a nation? And we should be lamenting because there are people who should be worshiping with us. And I'm not going to be very, very dogmatic on this. Maybe it's because of fear that they're not here. Maybe there are other reasons. Guys, you're listening to me online. We miss you. There's supposed to be 300 people here. There's probably less than 100 here. So I want you to know I'm your pastor. I am mourning this morning. I am sad. I want to see you here. And if it's something we could improve to make you come here, tell us. We will do it. Maybe we put too much fear in your hearts because of the warning, but we do that out of love. We don't want you infected. I want you to know the staff have done a good job, but if we put fear in your hearts, we apologize for that. Now we want you to come here and worship in faith. And so I am mourning, because there are many of you who can come here, but you won't. Whatever reasons you have, I ask you to come, you people listening to me online, you people listening to me on radio, please. Come here in faith. Don't be trapped in your homes in fear. If you're 18 to 65, you're healthy, you don't have a comorbidity, come here and worship with us again. This is what was happening to Israel. They wanted to celebrate. They wanted to praise God. But it was a bittersweet celebration. There was pain in their celebration, and that's life, my friends. Life is full of bittersweet celebrations. There was something painful in their celebration, and it's a way for God to remind us, you're not home anymore. That's why there will never be a pure experience of joy here on earth for a believer. Once you are a Christian, every victory you have will always have a taint of sorrow in it. Why are you saying that, Pastor? Look at your victories. Did you become cum laude, magna cum laude, summa cum laude by just sleeping? And you had to work for it, right? Did you just gain a, a successful business by sleeping all day and eating all day? You had to work for it. That's what I call the taint of sadness. There's a struggle in everything we do. We have to work, friends, very hard. That's why life is full of bittersweet celebration. Because God is reminding us, you're no longer home, daughter. This isn't your home anymore, son. I've got something far better for you. It's called heaven. Heaven, you don't work. You just enjoy worship and fellowship forever. Because that's what you were supposed to do from the beginning. Until Adam and Eve fell into sin. But when what breaks God's heart breaks ours too, friends, we are on the right track. Remember, it was from a desire for God's exaltation and love for others that their hearts were broken. That's the only reason my heart is broken, friends. I want more people to worship God online, but I also want more people to worship God on site. And prayer is a way to reach God's heart about our present trials. What is breaking your heart about your present situation? If there is anything breaking your heart about your present situation, then plead with God about your present trials. They're not meant to last forever. And in the meantime, God is shaping you to be better, not bitter. God wants you stronger, not weaker. He wants you a worshiper, not a complainer. So friends, 
Plead with God about your present trials. Plead with God about your bittersweet celebrations in life because we're not home yet. But plead with God and He will listen. We end with this last point, friends. Persist with God until you reap in the future. That's found in verses 5 to 6. This has become famous. This has been, even been made into a hymn. Verse 5, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. What is he saying? He's saying reaping with joy is always preceded by sowing in tears. The psalmist is saying, I know how life operates. You do not just throw some seed anywhere and then say, okay, I'm coming back for you in four months. You take care of yourself. That's not how it works. He knows that. But he probably was looking, the psalmist, at the devastated countryside of Israel. Maybe buildings burned to the ground, rubble where there used to be beautiful homes. Instead of fields, maybe remains of human beings, skeletons, bones, because Israel had become a battlefield, a place of conquest. And he was saying, how could we rebuild this land? How could we make it grow green again? And he was saying, it's not going to be easy. We will have to sow in tears. We will have to plow this land again. And then, you know, he's extending the metaphor to the whole of life. He may have started with an agricultural figure of speech, but he's now bringing it back to the entirety of life. He says, those who sow in tears, whether we're referring to the ground of Israel, littered with blood and human remains and rubble, or whether we're referring to our walk with God, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Reaping with joy is always preceded by sowing in tears. This principle is affirmed in Galatians 6, 7 to 9. In all its positive and negative implications, friend. Look at, I'll read this for you. Galatians 6, 7 to 9. Paul said, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. There was a pastor being introduced at a prison evangelistic event. This pastor was famous in the Methodist denomination. And one of the prisoners was chosen to introduce him. And this is how the prisoner introduced the famous Methodist pastor. He said, the Reverend Dr. So-and-so, he and I grew up together in northern Georgia. We played with the same friends. We went to the same school. We went to the same Sunday school. So we were two boys, the prisoner said, introducing the famous pastor. Then he said, one of the two boys found Sunday school, something for sissies. The other thought it was the most important thing in his life and continued in Sunday school. And then the prisoner said, the one introducing you, the one introducing him to you now is that other boy who stopped going to Sunday school himself. And the one I'm introducing to you is the boy who kept going to Sunday school. Ladies, gentlemen, doctor, and then he introduced the speaker. That's Galatians 6, 7 to 9. If you to the flesh sow, then you will reap corruption. That's what he's saying. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. I would just like to make sure we understand one another. Paul is saying there are some people who will reap the judgment of God. If you're listening to me online, on radio, on site, if you have never come to faith in Christ, if you think that Christ is someone who's just a good teacher, who taught good principles, you are in a lot of trouble, my friend. Christ is more than a teacher. Christ is more than a good moral example. 
Christ is the Son of God whom God gave to die on the cross that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. And until you come to a point where you say Christ is more than a teacher, more than a moral example, but I desire Him as the only hope of forgiveness I can have in God, for I am a sinner. Until you say that, until you say I put my trust in Him, and I plead with Him to save me, until you come to that point, you are described here in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. You are sowing to the flesh, and one day you will be like that prisoner introducing the famous reverend. You'll end up not just in prison. That's just for this life. You'll end up in an eternal prison that was originally meant for Satan and his demons. Is that where you want to end up? I like to make sure we understand one another. And if you've never come to faith in Christ, this is the time. Tell him, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I stand condemned. I am under your judgment already. And I beg for mercy. I beg for forgiveness. And I plead that you save me because you died for me on the cross. If you say that in your heart, and God knows you mean it, he will save you. He will forgive you. He will give you eternal life. He will make you a part of His kingdom. But He has to see that you mean it in your heart. It's called repentance towards God and faith in Christ. I want to read, beloved, the rest of the verse. And if you just heard me make that appeal, and you know you've not done that, will you please pray in your heart? And if you pray that prayer in your heart, will you please let us know? Because we'd like to help you be disciples. But verse 9 of Galatians 6 goes on to say, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not give up. What does it mean? He's now referring to Christians. He's saying, Christians, are you tired of ministry? Are you tired of Christianity itself? Is walking with God by faith something that has worn you out? He's saying, don't get tired. Don't get tired because in anything you do as a believer, realize that the best victories are often gained after the most painful struggles. Are you thinking about that person for whom you have been praying that, Lord, please let this husband, let this son, let this daughter, let this relative, let this friend come to Christ? And after years, you're saying, this is useless. Will God ever save him or her? Please do not give up. In anything, anything you do, realize that the best victories are often after the most painful struggles. Your business often teeters on the brink of bankruptcy. And you don't know where to go. You're on the point of despair. Don't give up. Do your business right. Do it with integrity. Do it with hard work and trust God. Don't give up. Your career is going nowhere. You think you're in a dead-end job. And you just want to walk out on life. Or you want to sink into depression or despair. Don't. Because the best victories are often gained after the most painful struggles. I don't know your situation in life. What God has asked you to sow in faith. I would like you to know that sowing in faith often involves sowing in tears. That's what the passage is telling us. God is telling us it's not going to be easy. Whether you're sowing your children to become godly men and women, or your spouse, or your parents, or whatever ministry God has given you, you're sowing there. I'd like you to know it will not be easy. And sowing in faith often means sowing in tears. How much would it cost you to sow in tears? Maybe everything. What will it take for you and me to say, I believe in the harvest, and therefore I will give what makes no sense. I'll give it 100%. The world would call me unreasonable to do this, but I will sow because I believe I will celebrate. I don't know what your situation is, but I hope you can say that in your heart. Three years ago in our missions conference, I gave this example. It's a story related by a a professor of missiology who was a missionary for 14 years in Western Africa. 
I just want to read portions of it for you because of time. But the name of the missionary and now professor is Del Tar. He said that when he was working in the Sahel portion of West Africa, it was the only time he finally understood what Psalm 126, 5 and 6 really meant. Please listen to this. He said, and I'm paraphrasing him, in Sahel Africa, rain only comes from May to August. Picture that. So the poor people there, they're all below the poverty line. They saw the seed in May. They harvest in October. And so October and November are seasons of celebration, rejoicing. By this, and they eat twice a day. That's how poor they are. They're already very happy if they eat twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. October and November, harvest. By December, the grain starts going down. By January, the grain has started going down even more. They're running out of supplies. They eat only once a day. By February, they not only eat once a day, they eat less of that remaining meal. The same in March. And then Missionary Delta says it's the worst in April, just before the rains in May. By April, they've all run out of grain. Entire communities, entire tribes, no more grain. What do they do? They go out and they look for roots. They look for leaves. They scrape the bark from trees. They turn it into a thin soup. And many of the children do not survive that because the breastfeeding mothers can no longer produce milk and many children die in April. And Missionary Deltar says, that's the hardest month for me to witness. And then usually in April, he says, some young boy will discover that daddy has been hiding grain somewhere in the house. And he will bring it to dad and says, dad, here's grain. Why are we starving? And then dad will say, son, that's for me. That's our seed for sowing. I cannot give that to you. We have to bear with this. And then this is the part I really like. Missionary Del Tar said, when May finally comes and the rain starts to pour, the same father will go out in the field. And as he's sowing the seed, he is literally crying. Tears are flowing down his cheek because for all those eight months, he had to see his family nearly die or actually die just so that he could sow the seed in May. And missionary Deltar said, finally, I understood what it means to sow in tears. Because not long from this, they will reap with joy. What will it take you and me to sow in tears so that we can reap with joy? The world sometimes will call us unreasonable, but you and I must sow nevertheless that someday, because we believe in the harvest, we will celebrate with songs of joy. It could be that son, that spouse, that office mate, that ministry, that business, that championship, whatever it is. Don't give up on that dream. So in faith, even if it means sowing in tears. By God's grace, someday you'll reap with joy. This passage, friends, is also a good reminder of how spiritual awakenings happen. And we're asking the question, can we see a mighty revival in our day? A revival, friends, comes only when, where, with whom, and how it pleases God. No one can dictate on God. I have a sense that we might be ripe for one. If not in the nation, maybe in the church. Because look at what's happening in 2020. I like the cartoon that says, you know, God is talking to an angel. God was telling the angel, did you do what I told you? Yes, I did, Lord. Okay. Did you put all the activities I told you in the 2020s? The angel said, Wait a minute, you said 2020s, plural. You mean the decade? Yes. I told you to put enough calamities in one decade so that people will come to me in faith. 
Then you said, I didn't hear you say 2020s. I thought you said 2020. So I put 10 years of calamity in 2020. That's how it feels, doesn't it? Maybe we are right for our revival. Very quickly, I just want to say and show you what has been proven by Christian historians in century, in, throughout the centuries about revival. What are some of the forerunners? First is prayer. Prayer is the primary forerunner of any revival. Friends, when the leaders of the church are praying, there should be a revival. When the leaders of the church are not praying, do not expect a revival. I don't think there's any shortcut to that. It may involve a group of people asking for God to invade their lives or ministries and church, but it is in humble intercession that the church acknowledges it is totally dependent upon the grace of God. The second is preaching. Any revival has always been accompanied by a return to strong biblical preaching and teaching that exalts Christ and exposes sin. I can guarantee you this, any kind of preaching that tries to cover up sin because it wants more members, because it doesn't want to turn away people who want to be comfortable in their sin. It will never bring about revival. It might bring a lot of members. You might grow a mega church very quickly if you never talk about sin. If your preaching is like a Reader's Digest how-to, it will grow a church very quickly. But please don't expect them all to be spiritually alive in Christ. There has never been a worldless revival in history. And finally, purity. Revival always requires a time of sin-confessing, sin-rejecting repentance. The Holy Spirit will never work through unholy people. Only in lowering ourselves before God can there be an exaltation of the saints by God. Is the nation ripe for revival? I don't know. Is GCF ripe for a revival? I pray so. I pray the leaders will be prayerful and attend the prayers that we are now setting up. I pray that the people will follow the lead of the leaders and not make the leaders alibis not to join prayer meetings. I pray that the preaching of the word will not be offensive to you to the point that you say, I do not want to be here. If it offends you, why not examine our lives first? Maybe God wants you to change. That's why it's offensive. And I pray that purity will never be second place in our church. I pray we desire purity so we will not lower the standards of the Bible's morality in the interest of getting more members. If and only if perhaps we have some of these or all of these, then maybe, if not in this country, at least in this church, we can have a revival. I want to close with this, friends. We said this in the beginning. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joy. The best outcomes often come after the hardest struggles. What does this mean? Those who sow in faith will reap with joy. But those who play it safe play to lose. Those who sow in fear shall reap nothing. They will harvest nothing but their own fears. Friends, even as we reopen the church, there are many who want to come but cannot. And there are those who can but will not, maybe for good reasons. This pandemic has sown fear, but we will not give in to fear. Remember, we worship God, not fear. The lockdown has shut down many businesses, but it cannot shut down God's church. And whether it is the church or your life, we must always believe with all our hearts that we must not grow weary for, of doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not give up. I am preaching to myself. In Galatians 6, 9, let us not give up. Let us not get tired of praying. Let us not get tired of preaching and teaching the Word of God, unadulterated, pure, and sometimes offensive. Let us not get tired of pursuing purity, even if it doesn't guarantee numbers, friends. But when we do think God's way, this is what I want you to be assured of. Our God makes all things beautiful in his time. God has a perfect time. He'll make it beautiful. I don't know when it will be for us. I hope it's soon. People online, we miss you all. If you're healthy, come over here and join us. I hope to see you next Sunday. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for bringing us to lament together. Our nation is broken, Lord. In one sense, our church is broken because many of us have been terrified by this virus, maybe almost to the point of paying more attention to our fear than our faith. We ask you, Lord, to build our faith again. We ask you to help us worship the one who alone should be feared, and that's you. Give us a faith that is not reckless, Lord, but that is filled with wisdom. And help us, Lord, whether it's our gathering, whether it's our ministry, whether it's our marriage, our parenting, our business, our career, to keep sowing in faith even when our hearts are broken. To keep sowing in faith, even when it demands that our tears become the water for the soil to be fertile. Keep us sowing in faith, Lord, even when the world thinks we've gone insane. But keep us sowing in faith, Father, because we know in your perfect time, your perfect way, we shall reap with songs of joy. We do not base our trust on what men say. We base our trust in you and your word. And so we will end worshiping you and rejoicing in you, our faithful God. We pray in the name of your Son, our only hope of forgiveness and salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear Father, we stand before you as weak people. People are often tossed about by our own fears, who sometimes think that fear is the way to survive. Turn us once again into people of faith, Lord. Not reckless faith, but faith with wisdom. Faith that looks at what is real, and yet faith that looks up to you. Father, we ask that as we go from this place today, you make us people who will continue to sow in faith, even if it sometimes means sowing in tears. Turn us into people, Lord, who will walk by faith with you, who look forward to that time that our faith will become sight, who look forward to that time when our sowing will be reaping with joy. Father, bless your people by helping them apply and helping me apply along with them every word of Psalm 126. Change us, all of us, into people of faith. This we pray as your blessing upon us, O Lord, and this we ask through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Go with God.